Hi, folks. Um, Glenn, can you advance, <coughs> advance one slide, please? Just trying to do that. Good. Here we go. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to today's seminar. We've got a um, a good uh, number online, so we'll kick off. Um, my name's Craig Hardner. I'm uh, associate professor in the Centre of Court Science, but I'm also chair of the um, Coffee Science Seminar. Um, and I've almost I've been. Uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, could you advance to the next slide, Glenn? Uh, so that's me. Okay, that's what I was supposed to say then. Next slide. Okay, so now I'd like to acknowledge country. Uh, the University of Queensland acknowledges traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands of which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and the global society. Next one, Glenn. Okay, so uh, today's seminar is from Glenn Fox. Um, Glenn worked with the uh, Queensland Department of Ag from 86 to 2010 when he joined uh, Coffee at the start of Coffee uh, at the same time um, I did as well, and a few of us did. Uh, and in the meantime, he'd completed his PhD and he worked as a postdoc at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. In 2019, Glenn was appointed um, as a, a Dowd Professor uh, of Brewing Science at the University of California, Davis, being only the third professor in a program running since 1958. His current research focuses on starch and protein structure and its impact on grain, malt and beer quality which incorporates a number of omics technologies. In 2018, he was elected a fellow of the Institute of Breeding, and in 22, he received an outstanding service award from UC Davis for professional education. Uh, he's also a prof uh, uh, extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch uh, and um, has an, uh, a research fellow at the University of Queensland and a visiting professor at National Ag Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. He's published one book, and with another one coming out in 2024, no doubt about beer. And he's got numerous book chapters and over 120 peer reviewed journal articles. Um, so Glenn, uh, so just in terms of how we're running this seminar. Um, so, uh, sorry, mate, can you just go back one? Uh, just to emphasize that um, the seminar will run to one o'clock. I'm not sure Glenn will speak that long and hopefully we've got opportunities for questions. Uh, and if we do have questions, that's one of my other roles of the facilitator. So can you enter your questions in the Q&A and then I can um, sort through those, which ones we can um, present to Glenn. So Glenn, um, I'll pass it over to you now. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Craig. And thanks everyone for the opportunity to come and chat about stuff that I have to do on a daily basis. And it's really terrible having to work in a brewery. You'll probably notice the subtitles on here. Uh, it's a default setting we have because I actually have a class that has 500 students and often those students might have visual or hearing um, concerns. So we actually have subtitles as a default. Um, but anyway, that'll be all recorded in case you want to circle back later. Uh, I just want to make one other announcement beforehand and something people next week might be interested in is a visiting uh, scholar from Weinstephan. Uh, in Germany, and Stefan next week is talking about Germany's oldest bottled beer, um, and it is really an interesting topic. So if you actually, and that's an in-person presentation, so it might be nice to to get out of the office and actually go for a walk around this lovely campus. And it's nice to have such a sunny day, uh, and it's nice to actually be in a place where the temperatures go under thirty degrees Celsius. We've had a summer where it's basically forty degrees Celsius most days. Uh, and Craig, you will have to tell me to shut up because I will talk about this stuff for hours. Um, so UC Davis is the oldest university-based brewing program in the US. Um, it started way back in 1958 and was actually initiated by industry. Uh, there was a brewery down in San Francisco called Lucky Lager, and they just couldn't find anyone that had any knowledge or experience working in brewing. So they approached Emil Marac, who was head of the Department of Food Science at the time, 
and said, well, can we set up a training program? And that was basically how it started. And that first conversation was 1956. Um, it wasn't until 1958 that they really started. They used the fermentation professor at the time to start that, but it was really when Michael Lewis was appointed as the first professor of brewing science in 1962, Michael came over from Wales uh, and he retired in 1998. And Charlie Banforth was appointed in 1999 and he was the first Anheuser-Busch endowed professor. Uh, and that was in 20, in the year 2000, there was a, a significant seven, seven figure endowment um, provided by Anheuser-Busch. Um, and I was appointed the second endowed professor in, in 19, 2019. That image shows the original brewery. This was a brewery donated by Lucky Lager, and that was in operation until 2006, uh, which is really hard to imagine that you could actually learn to make beer on that. But actually, if you could make beer on that, you're probably going to be a good brewer. Um, the program itself, we've had a couple of thousand students go through the brewing, the senior brewing course. Um, and the weird thing in the US, you've got to be 21 years old to be drinking. So we really can't have anyone in the brewery till they're 21, which means they've got to be fourth years. We've had a thousand students or so go through our master brewers program and about 90% of them have ambitions to go into the industry, even start their own breweries. Uh, and since Michael started way back in 62, there's been about 130 postgrads come through and we do a lot of industry training. And that image just shows the winning students from this year's senior class where they get to design their own recipes and brew those recipes and have those judged. And then the winning recipe is brewed at a local craft brewery and sold commercially. So the students get to go and brew uh, with Sudworks. Uh, and it's really a, quite a, um, a great process for the students to see how what they've learned in theory and done a little bit in terms of practical work can actually be translated into a commercial reality. That's the new brew house, um, well, part of the brew house. Uh, we have some packaging facility, we have some beautiful fermenters where we can do lots of yeast trials. And I never see anyone not smiling in the brewery. Um, considering the time, I might not show this video because it takes about seven minutes. Uh, but if, we, if we're if having a copy of this, you can go through this at a later time. Uh, I just think it'll just take way too much time. And it's gone and started without me wanting to do that. Let's just jump over that. So the current research program, and I am getting to the omics technologies, trust me, Craig. Um, but we're really dealing with some so many parallels with the, the grain industry in Australia uh, and certainly the brewing industry in Australia. Climate change is a big thing. And we can just say it's going to be climate change. But, well, what is that? Uh, and what does it mean to farmers? And it means something different to processors and it means something different to brewers. Um, but regardless of what it is, people buying their local beer, you go to Forex and you want to have a, a you know, Forex, Gold, you expect it to taste the same every time. So the, the molsters and the brewers have to have some uh, understanding of climate change and what it's impacting or how it's impacting, and then to deal with that in processing so it's not going to influence the quality of the final product. So that's what we're doing, trying to understand more of that and how climate change will impact quality. Um, a little bit of work in hop quality, and for those that aren't too, too familiar with the brewing process, hops is a plant material that brings the bitterness to beer. Uh, and that can be quite a polarizing thing for people that can be way too bitter. Um, or people like me that go as bitter as we can. Uh, I'm really in my happy place if we're drinking double IPAs. Uh, we're doing some more work on antioxidants. because There's been a lot of sort of extension of the brewing styles or beer styles with a lot of um, double and triple IPAs where we don't really know the antioxidant levels but the, on the other end of the scale there's a lot of non-alcoholic beers and there's a lot of competing beverages like kombucha and hot seltzers and those sorts of things now so we, we're sort of pro, reprofiling some of those. Um, some fermentation work looking at proline assimilation and some off flavours uh, caused by yeast and bacteria. Sustainability is a big thing we're upcycling some waste streams and sort of coupled or connected with some of or some of those or all of those is how we're using some omics technologies. Quickly, just to show you basically what the brewing process, and on paper, it looks really simple. We have a malting process where we're just germinating grain and drying grain to produce malt. And it's really the malt that gives beer most of its colour. 
Um, barley is the main grain used, but we will use wheat uh, as well. Um, but we can use sort of other grains to make gluten-free beer, so like sorghum and rice and corn and those sorts of things. The malting process is very different to the brewing process. And the malt will be delivered to the brewery. It's crushed into a really coarse powder mixed with hot water. Uh, we're basically extracting all the sugars and colour compounds and proteins and antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we'll transfer that liquid into a kettle. And as the name suggests, we just go through a boiling process and then we just throw in some hops. Uh, and the boiling actually intensifies the bitterness. Um, and we can add hops multiple times, uh, which really will drive the bitterness up. Uh, and then at some point we say, well, that's enough. We'll clarify that, put it through a whirlpool, cool it off, uh, and then put it into fermentation. This is where we're adding yeast and just let natural fermentation happen. And then we can clear all that and put it in a package. Boy, that really sounds simple. If only that was true. Uh, and we can add hops there. When we talk about beer quality, what could influence beer quality? And we're certainly understanding, understanding more about the genetics of the raw materials uh, and certainly growing environment or what you might call providence or terroir is sort of a, a focus for some, some parts of the industry. We know that there's an interaction between the raw material itself, the environment that was growing in and the brewing process. So it's not a simple thing. So let's just fix some genetics and we'll understand everything. That doesn't work. Uh, let's just get grain from a certain environment. Well, that doesn't work either. Um, and we'll only make beer a certain way. Well, that doesn't work either. So it's really understanding there will be significant interaction between these and it's where we can tap into that to try and understand some of these things. Um, hopefully already you're seeing that this isn't as straightforward as, as you thought. Uh, beer really is very complicated, even though we're only using four ingredients. And this is historical. Uh, and certainly in Germany with their beer law, they can only use four ingredients. We're using water, malt, hops and yeast um, and they still have that old law the, the 1512 Rhein Heiskabut law uh, so they're a little worried about what climate change might do to some of their raw materials and under the law they won't be able to add anything else um, so from that context uh, climate change could really impact uh, a, a big brewing region in the world talk about malt quickly Basically, malt is germinated in dried grain, and it provides all the fermentable sugars and amino acids that the yeast needs. It provides colour and some flavour. Um, and, and this is one of these things we've used technology, or we've used methods that are more than 100 years old, and it's sort of the paradox of our industry. It can be incredibly innovative. And some of the beer styles we're looking at, some of the engineering technologies they, they, they're developing for uh, high, high throughput, more efficient systems, and yet when we measure the basic stuff, we're still using methods at more than 100 years old. And this is where we, we've got challenges to sort of encourage the industry to think beyond methodologies that's 100 years old. Um, but then if we talk about omics technologies, then that's not the sort of thing you can put in a brewery or a malt house. You can't put an LC MSMS in a malt house, um, certainly not a craft malt house. Um, so we've got to work a way that we can actually translate some of the research we're doing into a more applied uh, and usable technology. But just in there alone, we're talking about hundreds of individual compounds, hundreds of individual compounds that can impact processing as well as quality. Uh, and this is where sort of I've pushed the industry even before I left um, UQ and went to Davis. We were pushing the industry to think beyond just less measuring things in terms of content, say 12% protein. And a lot of industries measure protein content and think, well, that tells us everything. Well, no, it doesn't. It tells you virtually nothing. Um, let's talk about composition. What's the composition of those proteins? How many proteins? Uh, and this is where we're trying to sort of sort of, sort of, of tack and come in from the side wind. Uh, and hopefully they'll understand that we're not trying to just completely rip the, the rug out from under and, and tell them they've got to change everything. When we talk about wort, wort is the liquid that we actually produced when we're mixing the malt with water. Uh, and we actually measure gravity, uh, specific gravity. So if you work in the food industry, you might be very familiar with using the, the measurement of bricks. Uh, that's not bricks to build a house. That's BRIX, which is basically a measure of gravity. Uh, but the industry uses uh, a similar term. We call it Plato because there was actually a gentleman uh, 
a German chemist who came up with this sort of additional measure of gravity. Um, so we use degrees Plato. It's basically measuring the amount of sugar in our liquid. We can relate that to potential fermentability. But we do know that that only tells us, you know, it's basically a corner piece in the jigsaw puzzle. We've still got so much more information we have to capture. Uh, and half the time we, we're not capturing it and things don't go to plan. Uh, and many breweries, it doesn't go to plan. They still get through the process, um, but it doesn't always go to schedules. What's in the word itself? Yeah, there's plenty of sugar, and that's what the, the yeast needs, but there's all these other things. There's intact proteins, there's hydrolyzed peptides, and there's individual amino acids. There's polyphenols and phenolic acids. There's lots of Maillard and Strecker compounds that'll influence color and flavor. Uh, and beer is loaded with minerals and vitamins. Beer, beer has all the B group vitamins. Uh, and this is just one area where we like to have a little bit of a go at the wine industry, just a little bit of a go at the wine industry. Uh, wine doesn't have any vitamins uh, and certainly none of the B group vitamins. In amongst all of that, there's a mix of volatile and non-volatile compounds. Um, so what do we measure? They say, okay, we can measure more, but what are we going to measure? And we're still trying to work out what's the most functional and translatable measurement for them out of some of this omics. Uh, if we talk about fermentable sugars, yes, we can give them fermentable sugar profiles and they probably could consider changing their fermentation methodologies. Um, and we can actually calculate potential alcohol from the amount of fermentable sugars. So certainly fermentable sugars, we can give them fermentable sugars instead of just working with gravity, we'll give you fermentable sugars. That might sound pretty good. We can measure protein, but which protein? And anyone that's done any proteomics, um, and it seems like the technology is just getting better and better and better. And when we got, we've gone from two or three years ago when we do proteomics to measure about seven or 800 proteins in barley, to now they're hitting something like well over a thousand, close to 2000 proteins. Again, which one um, or which group of proteins would be most important? The old Osborne uh, methodology where they just separate proteins based on solubility. We're talking albumins, globulins, prolamins and glutelins. Um, that's basically the distribution of those individual proteins. How many proteins in, in each of those solubility fractions? Well, with the albumins and globulins, there's hundreds of individual proteins. But with the prolamins and glutelins, there's only a handful, really, in comparison. And this is where one area we think we can start to sort of target an improved way to assess quality, uh, looking at the storage proteins, the prolamins and glutelins, rather than just measuring total protein, because it's, uh, it, it's fewer proteins, but they're most significant because they have an impact on processing. And certainly the foam you have, and certainly I'm encouraging everyone to drink beer from a glass uh, so you can see that lovely foam. It's these peptides from these prolamins <clears throat> that form the bubble wall. So when you look at those lovely little white bubbles, it's actually this protein or this peptide that helps form the wall of the bubble. So that's really important. Unfortunately, the same proteins can then cause a haze. And up until probably 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago, Hazy beer was not popular. And if we saw hazy beer, we immediately assumed there was a defect. Now it's all about let's make beer as hazy as we can. And half the time you think you're drinking chicken soup. Um, so it's really going, oh, my God, what do we do with producing consistent haze? It's just a complete oxymoron. So we, we are trying to move from this content to composition paradigm. Uh, so we've got to dive a little deeper. But how deep do we go? Some of you are probably already heavily involved in using some of these omics technologies. Um, and the thing we're doing, I'm doing this week at UQ. Um, and if you didn't know, we have a brewery at UQ now. Uh, that was the, one of the last things I managed to get done before I left. Uh, and thank you to Coffee and SAFS and the School of Chemistry and the School of Engineering for providing the funds for us to get a brewery and the brewery is now located in the Liveris building. Um, so we're, we're actually doing some experiments th these couple of days to actually brew some different beer styles where we're actually taking proteomics and metabolomics samples. Uh, and that's the first time we've had, anyone's ever done that to compare proteome and metabolome uh, in, in beer on a time, time course. Uh, 
I'm prattling on. Uh, I just wanted to promote the brewery. <laughs> but any of these technologies takes time. Significant days to run the analysis and then probably significant months to interpret the data. Uh, and no brewery in the world would say, oh, that's okay. You take six months and then tell us the result in six months and we'll change our practices. No, they need a little bit more data a little bit sooner than that. And we know that cost of some of these things can be quite significant while all these things are in development. Once it becomes routine, then the costs come down. And again, this is not something you can have um, someone who's come from um, maybe an industrial background and say, well, we're going to put you in the lab and we're going to teach you to do proteomics. We do need trained people. We need do need generally academically trained people to, to run these technologies. Again, you might be familiar with this sort of structure uh, in terms of assistance biology. Some of you will be working the DNA level, some at the transcript level. Uh, the proteomics level is there, uh, but then we're also working in this sort of phenotype level. What's in beer? What's the metabolites in beer? Again, going back to this particular image, this is where we uh, sort of proteomics became um, a new science. Um, and anyone that's done some standard electrophoresis uh, and you do one-dimensional electrophoresis and you might have done an SDS page and you're separating some protein, proteins on molecular size. Uh, and then at some point people decided, well, we can do uh, electrophoresis with separating proteins on size, but we can also separate the proteins on charge. But if you combine the two, then you can separate individual proteins on size and charge. So you get these uh, gels with these spots, and then you could remove the spot and actually do some analysis of that spot, maybe get a, a protein sequence, amino acid sequence. Then proteomics came along, and suddenly you went from measuring a few dozen proteins to a few hundred proteins. Uh, and the game changed in terms of really understanding all the grain, all the proteins that are left over in the grain at harvest, and how many of them become passengers in a process. And we literally have hundreds of proteins left over in the development of the barley grain that have no contribution to the malting and brewing process and are basically sitting in your glass of beer happily doing nothing. We think. <laughs> but now we know they're all there. Um, we also know the other ones that are expressed during malting and the proteins that could influence quality. And now we can sort of see where these things might be most significant and which ones might be future targets for more um, precise analysis. There's that, all that Osborne classification stuff. Um, it moved from solubility classes to, to more functional classes, and they talk about storage proteins, structural proteins, and met metabolic proteins. Take it up to another level, or you go down another level a little bit deeper, uh, and actually we can separate hundreds of proteins into many, many more functional groups. And this is where we can actually start to understand what proteins contribute to heat stress. Our plants will be growing in a hotter climate. How can they survive without heat, or how can they survive drought? Um, so understanding what proteins are still functional, uh, or can we actually modify some of these proteins that they're more functional? Uh, so we now can sort of dive that little bit deeper in understanding the, the, the metabolic uh, function of a lot of these proteins. For, for us, which peptides and proteins and amino acids are important? Um, from the hundreds of proteins we know we can measure, there's a handful that we know at the moment of significance. And this is where I think proteomics, certainly in, in my industry, uh, and I think it has more relevance in the malting industry than the brewing industry, will really come to assist us in being able to select better quality under these potentially stressful conditions. There are a number of enzymes that are important in the malting process. We need um, enzymes to reduce or break down beta-glucan or rabinoxylan. We need to break down those storage proteins, but there's about 40 proteases and nobody's got a good assay for any one of them. Um, let alone more than one of these proteases. And there's a bunch of, of starch-degrading enzymes as well. So we know the enzymes are potential targets. We know there's foam-positive proteins, and lipid transfer protein, their LTP, is actually in the embryo of the grain. Uh, 
And it basically just travels through the malting process and travels through the brewing process, and then it will contribute to foam in the finished beer. We know these hoarding peptides also contribute to foam. All of these are left over from grain fill, and we can only see that using proteomics. Uh, and certainly we do get some slight changes during German germination, um, but it's really to do with the expression of enzymes. So this is where I see, as I, as I mentioned briefly before, um, proteomics probably has a better fit in the malting industry rather than the brewing industry at the moment. So we've done some research on barley, of course, wheat, rice, sorghum and some other grains um, where we're trying to understand uh, sort of within a grain, under growing, different growing conditions, what might change in the proteome. Comparing between grains, because we still, if whether you're using wheat or rice or sorghum, you still want to produce a beer that tastes like beer. So you're looking for beer that produces a foam. Uh, you're looking for a nice clear beer. Um, so understanding how some of these proteins from these other species can still produce that beer that we're expecting. And we're looking at alternative grains as well. So beyond the sort of big five grains, um, things like Kernza uh, and Millet uh, and Amaranth and, and a lot of these other what we might call more ancient grains, even though all grains are ancient, um, but the less typical grains used in the industry. We're trying to understand what changes during the malting process and what will end up in beer. And that image there is just a, those two images, just basically what a malt house looks like. This is a germination bed and the grain is sort of leveled out on this germ bed. And then every day the grain is turned uh, to, for a bit of aeration uh, and allowed sort of cooling. So this is an experiment we did quite a long time ago. Uh, and basically we're looking from left to right with the changes in in colour intensity is with changes in protein content, not so protein expression or the proteome from the raw grain to the to the kiln. And this is what I think the, the industry and and I might be given too much away here, but that's fine uh, as long as the industry gets benefit. When we do any sort of enzyme assay, we need a substrate, we need an enzyme, and we might measure product from that enzymic reaction. As I said, with the proteases, it's around 40 proteases. So which protease is important and which substrate does that work on? Um, so again, it got so complicated, it was just almost impossible for anyone to rationalise and encourage the industry to think we can develop a protease assay. I think this is where proteomics steps up to the plate. Uh, that's my American analogy. Um, we can actually measure substrate. So that right-hand image is actually showing a change and a decrease in the storage proteins during the malting process. At the same time, we're seeing an increase in the proteases. Now, this is only set at that time was semi-quantitative. Um, as I understand it now with the pro some of the proteomics methodologies, it's more it's quantitative. So we're going to try and repeat some of this with the new methods. And we can actually get more precise measurements on enzyme activity, as well as loss of substrate. So I think for the malting industry, this is probably where proteomics is gonna have a better fit, but there's lots of other proteins, as I said, so we can look at changes in our main proteins. There's a bunch of inhibitors. Uh, there's an alpha amylase inhibitor there. There's a serine protease inhibitor, uh, Serpin Z4, which also contributes to foam quality. Uh, and lipoxygenase, it actually contributes to staling. So we don't want our beers to go stale. Um, and normally, uh, and, and some of the breeding companies, Carlsberg and Sapporo in Japan have produced lox nulls. So these barleys don't produce lipoxygenase. Um, so that's one way to get around that. And just some other proteins there uh, that we, we know are important. So we can measure all of these proteins simultaneously, including the enzymes. Um, so when I talk to the malts and say, well, this is my where we might be able to fit proteomics into understanding your malt quality. So this is a standard malt certificate of analysis. So when a brewer buys some malt, theoretically, they should be getting a piece of paper uh, or they can download it from the, the maltster's website that says, here is your quality. This is the quality of the malt you've just bought. Um, lots of traits there. Where does proteomics fit in? Uh, and that sort of box on the right sort of suggests where some of these proteins and enzymes will can be related to that quality. 
the beauty is that we can measure all of those things in a proteomics analysis. So we're going to try and be able to, we're are trying to relate more of these important proteins to these individual numbers uh, and relate it back so it'll actually have some meaning to the molsters. Let's jump into the beer proteome. And similarly, we can actually track changes in the brewing process. Uh, so the, the figure on the left is some work I did with Ben Schulz from the School of Chemistry here uh, a few years ago. We're actually looking at uh, all the proteins in foam, beer foam. Uh, yes, yes, the industry actually funds those sorts of projects. Uh, and the image on the right there is some work that uh, ben, um, Ben's student, Ed Kerr, uh, was doing to his PhD, uh, and we were actually looking at some sorghum as well as some barley samples. Uh, and that's, I think, just been accepted, I hope. Um, so this is where we can understand the similarity or the disconnect between species that are used in the brewing process. So I think the image on the left is some barley and the image on the right is sorghum. And we can actually see that in, in the case of barley, some of these proteins become more abundant relative to the other proteins. In the case of sorghum on the right, most of them are losing activity during the heating phases uh, and they remain relative to each other in abundance, but they become much lower uh, in, in, the, in the total abundance. The other noticeable thing is the scale on the y-axis. It's almost a tenfold difference in some of these proteins, but at least we can understand what are the most significant proteins in barley and how we can translate that information and what we need in these other grains. Um, so in, in terms of developing future varieties of, of say, rice or sorghum or corn that might be used in the industry, um, we can say, well, you need to think about selecting for these types of proteins. Uh, and there's just a couple of examples. And again, look at the scale on the y-axis and these different uh, alpha amylase from barley compared to sorghum. And not to be outdone, uh, we actually did a global proteomic study. So we took it from the lab uh, and our lab, that's the brewery uh, and UC Davis. And we brewed our standard Aggie Ale um, and uh, where we sent that around the world, where, they, where we couldn't send it, we said, we'll get some Heineken. Uh, and then we said to those labs, get two or three local craft beers. And uh, we ended up with about, in total of only about 30 something labs that could complete the study uh, and the data analysis has started uh, and that was two years ago and is still going um, mainly because they ended up with um, more than 100 beer samples um, and in some cases people were getting two or three thousand proteins from the beer samples so it is a massive data set uh, and it is a work in progress what it's telling us is the variation in the contribution from all the raw materials and how that contributes to beer styles or different beer styles and beer quality. So while it's still you know, a couple of years off before we'll see any significant output from the results, uh, it really has will be very informative um, because most times brewers or people doing any sort of proteomics, they might pick a fairly standard lager recipe or a fairly standard ale recipe, and they don't go beyond some of the beyond that to get into some really dark beers, IPAs, sour beers. Um, so we can actually see where the proteome fits with all these different beer styles. Um, hopefully next year we'll see some of that. Uh, so just an overview of the proteomics. Don't go yet when we've got to get into metabolomics, but the proteomics, um, as it sort of you see, it's a snapshot of all the proteins and understanding all the proteins. We can move from a univariate, and some of you might be doing single enzyme assays. Great. You can be really quantitative with a single enzyme assay. But also this allows us to look at a multivariate selection. We can see lots of the presence of lots of proteins, lots of enzymes and how they might change during a process. Particularly where we're interested in proteases, it allows us to see a change in the substrates. And while we're not measuring products precisely, depending upon where some of these peptides are detected in their abundance, we might be able to understand where some of these substrates or some of these products are relative to the starting substrate. We use the old analogy from grain to glass. Um, 
you know, from farm to fork, all those sorts of things. Uh, but proteomics will certainly help us understand that a lot more. But it is a work in progress. And at this point in time, I haven't met anyone that will convince the industry they've got a solution. Um, and proteomics will give them that solution. Now, if we get into uh, metabolites or metabolomics, probably the first thing we think about in the brewing industry is all the aromas that come from hops. And for those that like an IPA uh, and you're sitting maybe later today um, having an IPA, you get these tropical aromas or you might get these citrusy aromas coming from the hops. Um, metabolomics allows us to understand all the chemicals involved in producing these aromas. It also allows us to understand how the brewing process influences the final aromas in the beer. And it's one of those things you've got to be consistent in producing an aroma, uh, not only consistent in producing a colour and consistent in producing the amount of alcohol present in the beer, but if you're drinking your standard IPA and you know it should smell a certain way, has a certain aroma profile, and a month later you're drinking that in a different location, it's got to smell exactly the same. Uh, also, it allows us to look at some other um, products produced when we're actually adding hops in fermentation. Uh, and we have this thing called hop creep, uh, where we're actually producing more fermentable sugars than we want, uh, and it can impact the actual alcohol and CO2 levels. A lot of industries will talk about terroir or providence. Um, and I know Heather Smythe here at, at Coffee has done some amazing work over the years to look at and setting up flavour wheels uh, for different food compounds, the seafood and honey and those sorts of things. Uh, well, the moulding industry sort of grabbing onto that as well and go, well, we can talk about flavour and we can talk about variety flavours and we can talk about environmental flavours. Um, but to do that, we've got to actually do metabolomics. We can do sensory and we have done the sensory, but we've got to understand, is it the same compound producing exactly the same aroma or the same combination of compounds producing those aromas? Um, so colleagues have started some of this work and we're continuing some of this work. Uh, a colleague of mine in, in over in New York, she's really started most of this where they're looking at barley varieties, working with Pat Hayes in, at Oregon State, uh, and then looking at compounds as well as sensory attributes uh, so we can actually do these biplots to see where compounds are associated with certain um, sensory attributes. We can understand the effect of malting. We understand the effect of brewing. But this is one of these things where if we're looking for malt flavours and aromas, we cannot produce hoppy beers because the hop aromas just overwhelm any of the malt or yeast aromas. Um, so this is where you can only really produce light lagers and light ales because um, if you go too hard in the hops, you won't be able to detect any of the malt aromas. Uh, but again, a bit like the, the proteomics, you can do some gene ontology and cluster all of these particular metabolites into uh, functional groups. Um, so same sort of thing. This, in this case, it's a, it's a pie chart, uh, but then we can clearly understand where the, the distribution uh, of all these different compounds are. Uh, and the difference between the top and the bottom is actually aroma compounds versus just non-volatile compounds. And we see there's quite a difference in the distribution of what are aroma compounds versus non-volatile compounds. Understanding the actual effect of processing. Uh, so this is work we've done here before I split to, the, to, to Davis, looking at the difference between some sorghum beer uh, and some normally uh, normal barley beer and understanding the influence of phenolic acids on aroma um, rather than doing just simple LC or GC separating phenolic acids, we can actually do the whole metabolome and see all these other compounds that may even be precursors uh, to some of these other aroma products. And the last thing we've got into is this malt aging study. Uh, and generally, the maltsters will say, no, we'll sell you malt, which is going to be, it's going to be fresh. And it'll only be two weeks old. And most brewers don't want to buy malt that's less than two weeks old. So it's got to have that sort of settling or maturation period of, of two weeks to a month. Uh, but occasionally, we know that maltsters might sell stuff that's a little old. And occasionally, craft brewers have got a few bags of malt sitting in the back corner and they forget about them. And they pull them out six months later and go, we should use this malt. Uh, and they do, 
and suddenly the beer tastes a little funky. Um, so understanding the impact of uh, age, malt age, and certainly metabolomics is a way to, to dive into that. So we work with three malt companies and they supplied a fresh set of malt. Um, we brewed our Aggie Ale with that. We sent that around to a commercial brewery for some century and also another pub testing to just for a consumer analysis. Uh, and we're doing metabolomics on the finished beer from fresh malt, malt that was sick, the same malt that's been aged for six months and the same malt that's been aged for 12 months. Uh, this is just the example between the fresh malt and the 12 month old fresh malt, if that makes sense. Um, and that's the three different malts there in those three different colors. And we can clearly see that there's one malt with, on the gray, represented by the gray line, where it's just a little different. Uh, and we've spoken to that particular maltster about what he's doing with his malt. And anyway, I'm not going to say what he was doing with his malt, but it wasn't terribly fresh at any time. Um, so this was sensory data. We're putting metabolomics against some of these sensory uh, parameters uh, and we'll be able to understand what's going on with that particular molster, but also what's the overall difference between some of these particular aroma compounds because some of these are quite broad uh, in terms of what compounds would contribute to that. And everyone's different in how they do sensory. Um, so I could say it's bitter, but I might be picking up a slightly different bittering compound to maybe you. And we're both saying it's bitter, but they could be slightly different bittering compounds. Uh, and we'll end up with these sorts of, of, of biplots, lots of dots, uh, and we'll see where uh, what some of these dots tell us. The other thing, uh, sort of circling back to the very start, and I'm nearly there, Craig, um, is with climate change, uh, 2020 and 2021 were significant wildfires, as they call them in the US, uh, bushfire seasons. Uh, and certainly 2021 was horrendous. Uh, and uh, it's the biggest natural disaster uh, that certainly Washington State and even Oregon State had. Uh, that image there is actually the sun uh through the smoke haze itself uh and these images are supplied by colleagues at yakima chief hops there up in the yakima valley in washington um and basically they couldn't see the end of the row uh so the hops grow on these trellises and they harvest the hops um on the off these strings and you basically on that image on the right there you cannot see the end of the row uh and the u.s has a, a thing called water quality uh, air quality index and basically, if it goes above about 150, they're, perhaps they're saying, do not go outside. If you have any sort of breathing condition, if you have asthma or something like that, do not go outside. You are really at a high risk. Um, and 2020, and especially 2021, uh, it was basically air quality index was terrible for weeks. But we know the smoky compounds. Uh, typical smoke compounds, guaiacol, uh, syringol, creosol sorts of things. Um, so we had to set up a method. And again, one of those things people say, well, we've got a method in, in wine. Uh, they'd set up a method a few years previously to measure smoke contamination of grapes because we're harvesting the grapes the same time we harvest hops or vice versa. Um, they said, well, you've got a method in grapes. Let's do a method in hops. And we went, sure, it should be pretty easy. Well, we were so wrong. Um, we were just so wrong. But anyway, uh, my staff did a great job, spent months trying to optimise a method, uh, and we now have a method to, to measure these smoky compounds, and we can actually measure it even in finished beer. So they've actually used some smoky hops, uh, have gone in to produce beer, and in, can actually intensify the, the smoky flavour. Now, there are certain beer styles where you have an expectation of smoky flavour, but not in a pale ale. Um, so... The method's been great to be able to sort of quantify some of these smoke compounds. And this is where metabolomics didn't pick some of these compounds up. This was actually had to be very targeted. Uh, metabolomics didn't pick some of these things up. So we understand that metabolomics will be pretty good, a bit like proteomics. It'll go a long way, but sometimes it won't tell us everything we're looking for. Uh, and <laughs> this is probably something I shouldn't share um, with you guys, but it's a reality. Um, and it just doesn't affect beer. Uh, all of this stuff is found in wine. Uh, 
um, or not the skunk, uh, but it's found can be found in beer. Uh, but certainly metabolomics can allow us to see some of these particular compounds. And yes, skunks, uh, it, it's a terrible aroma. Um, you can actually smell this methyl butene thiol from miles away. Uh, so you might be out cycling and you go, oh, there must be skunk near here. No, it could be a mile away. It just contaminates the whole air uh, and it's really unpleasant. And you think, well, I certainly don't want my beer to taste like that. But we understand what happens there and we can actually do preventative steps so the beer won't become skunked. Uh, and Tomcat or cat pee, um, certainly that can happen in wine, but that's just an oxidation of a thiol uh, coming from hops. And the recent work we've been looking at is mousy. Uh, and again, we really don't want to think about anything tasting like mouse aroma or mouse pee, uh, but it can happen in wine and it can happen in sour beers. And it's usually as a result of some sort of bacterial fermentation. Uh, so metabolomics has allowed us to sort of tracing or chasing some of these particular off flavors, uh, but also allow us to see the precursors. Uh, in, in, in the mouse pea case, it's, a, it's particular amino acids uh, that are modified to produce this tetrahydopyridine. So in terms of a summary, a couple more slides after that. Uh, but we're working with a really complicated product. Uh, we've got four raw ingredients. Uh, but the variation coming from each of those ingredients, where they're grown, different varieties, uh, different processing can all impact whether we're looking at proteomics or metabolomics. Uh, but we've got to go through the sort of the, the tough stuff to get to the maybe the easier stuff. And it requires a lot of work to go through these different methodologies to see what might work uh, for the malting industry and what might work better for the brewing industry. Either way, we need some really, really good experimental design and data analysis. And I'm still glad I'm working with Alison Kelly and Clayton Faulkner uh, up there in DAF. Alison's with UQ now um, because they are really insightful in actually getting good experimental design because you are dealing with thousands of results or thousands of data points across hundreds of samples. So if you've got really crappy design, Guess what? You know the answer. Um, so something else I just wanted to sort of mention briefly is the diversity, equity, inclusion. We, we're working in an industry that's very, very traditional and could be easily and correctly described as misogynistic. Uh, so we've got a number of initiatives happening where we're working with different groups uh, and that bottom image on the left there, I'm working with the National Black Brewers Association uh, to develop some training programs for them. Uh, that image in the middle there is Mariana Schneider, who won our diversity award uh, scholarship for the Master Brewers Program. And she was with us last week in Davis, uh, brewing on our little nano systems and having lots of fun. And the image on the right there in the middle is, is Missy Begay and Shyla Fox, no relation. Uh, and they're Native American women. Missy is a Navajo and Shiloh is a Lakota. Uh, they're married and they're the only Native women that own a craft brewery in America. And I think there's only three Native-owned craft breweries out of 9,000 in America. So we're trying to do more to um, lift that part of the industry. Uh, and time for some uh, unapologetic promotion. Uh, this is the book I recently published with Charlie Banforth. This is the one that's coming out next year. It's an e-book. Uh, this is to acknowledge all my grad students uh, that I've got with me, uh, still connected with UQ in a really strong way. Uh, and also I've got a colleague there at University of Sydney that's doing some brewing with Triticale, uh, a couple of postdocs and a visiting scientist from Asahi uh, looking at some dry hopping. We get lots of donations. We don't chase federal government funding. We don't chase much funding at all. We actually are incredibly lucky, and this has been going on for a very long time, where people just want to give us money or they just want to donate equipment. Uh, so there's a lots of organisations there that have been very generous. Uh, the three on the left particularly generous, and they've donated seven-figure amounts to the program, uh, and all those others have donated cash or in-kind kind 
Uh, it's really easy to ring up and get uh, bags of malt to do, do brew trials or bags of hops, sachets of yeast, all those sorts of things. So that's it for me. Uh, back over to you, Craig. Sure. Excellent, Glenn. Thanks very much. I, I feel like going out for a beer already. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so um, Ian's got a few questions here, so I'll start with them. And uh, anybody else is uh, more than happy to uh, put some questions in the chat. Uh, the first one I'll start with is, have you tried the milk stout from Catchment at West End? No, but if he wants to bring me one, I will. Okay, well, we'll see. How long have you been in town? I got here Saturday and I'm actually headed to Rockhampton tomorrow. Um, okay, right. Yeah. So, so grab me this afternoon and we might have a couple of lemonades. Sure. So Ed, a bit more uh, pointed. Uh, great seminar, Glenn. What was what's the difference in enzyme activity between sorghum and barley entirely genotypic? Or was there some of it driven by the higher moulding temperature? That sorghum may have required? I think most of the enzymes in sorghum are a bit more um, sensitive to, to the final kilning temperatures and certainly sensitive to uh, the heat, the hot conditions in the brewing uh, process. So while they still have the same sorts of enzymes, I think the uh, isoproteins uh, or the isozymes aren't exactly the same they can they would be considered thermostable and i guess the the comparison would be because they've been brewing malting grade barley for more than 100 years and they've pretty much understood the important enzymes for 50 or 60 of those years and have been targeting those enzymes particularly the starch degrading enzymes and have been selecting for those specifically, whereas probably breeding for molting grade sorghum and even molting grade wheat hasn't received the same attention. So it could well be that those types of enzymes are available in sorghums. And we know that certainly in some African countries, they have very good sorghums for brewing beer. Um, but I think in general, we, we haven't targeted those specifically uh, for the brewing process. They could easily exist. Yep. So and then he's got a follow up of uh, would a sorghum with a lower germination temperature be more suitable for malting? He's got a friend in Germany that wants to know. Well, it's probably not necessarily the temperature of germination. Uh, the germination temperature certainly speeds up the process. And we know that sorghum is a grain that really does do better when germination temperatures are a little warmer, closer to 22, 23 Celsius. Often it's to do with the kilning process and you're getting temperatures over 70 degrees Celsius. Most enzymes are losing activity. Even in barley, all the enzymes lose some percentage of activity. Um, but the low moisture content helps preserve some of that activity. Um, and I think it's just, you, you'd have to find possibly, not necessarily a germination process, but maybe a kilning process that helps preserve some of those enzymes. Uh, so instead of kilning up to 60 to 70 degrees, you might hold it at 60 degrees for 20 hours. You'll get the moisture content down, but you might not denature those enzymes as much. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we actually uh, go to the higher temperatures is to get the moisture content down. Most germination moistures are around 40, 45% water, um, but also... And, and, and you can't handle the grain when it's that wet. So you've got to get rid of that water content and you get down to about 4% water, 4% moisture. But also those high temperatures help with the colour compounds and Maillard compounds. So again, it's to do with sort of those quality attributes, moisture and colour that we go these higher temperatures. Uh, if you're producing any beer with a darker colour, the temperatures get well above 80 to, to 100 degrees Celsius, which in, initiates a more intense colour but it really does kill quality. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Can you give us a sort of a brief view, summary of where you think brewing the brewing landscape's going in the next five years, I guess, from a US perspective? Well, I, I guess the US is sort of seen as the leader in, in some ways because in the last 10 years, it's gone from around 3,000 breweries to nearly 10,000 Um it's one of those things, the, it, they're incredibly innovative, looking at new flavours, new raw materials. Uh, part of that is sustainability. Part of that is cost. 
um, barley prices go up, uh, wheat prices go up, hop prices can go up, and you know even not just climate change, but if there's some conflict in the world, and we're very familiar with what's going on in the Ukraine, that's had a huge impact on on grain supplies around the world. So those sorts of tipping points can have a huge impact. Um, so they're looking for alternatives. Um, so the drivers are sustainability. Where can the industry be more sustainable? Uh, alternative raw materials, uh, looking for something different. Um, and I think that's where they're headed. You'll still see your traditional beers, but you will see really see some, so I wouldn't say questionable, but less typical beer styles coming into the market. And last week they had the Great American Beer Festival and the judging, and there's 94 categories of beer. 94. Um, and I think that's gone up about 10 categories in a couple of years. Um, so I think there'll be some really interesting new styles presented to us in the next few years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we'll see. We'll see how we go with those. Look, I'd like to uh, wrap it up there, Glenn, unless uh, uh, there's any other questions. Um, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, it's great. You know, I, I, I did want to say at the start, it's great to have, you know, the people that have come through coffee come back and, you know, present these seminars um, to, to maintain the connection with the, the with the Institute. So um, next time, give us a bit of notice and we'll... Um, can have a couple of beers after work or something like that. But Ian's got a growler of that uh, malt, uh, milk stout at home if you can, uh, yeah, come back again soon. Okay, I will. Just for that, Ian. Just for <laughs> you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody to attending. And um, we'll see, oh, oh, can you flick on? Yeah. Next week, we've got a great talk from uh, Patrick Mason that works in the Centre of Prop Science. Um, and um, that's his title of his talk up there uh and have we got one more slide yeah and if you want to view any of these seminars here's the qr code but they've been um put up on the uh internet as well as on uh youtube so i'd encourage you to review some of those and look through glenn's old uh glenn's talk to get some more snippets of golden information thanks and very much think for about Think about doing some research in the new brewery we've got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I was going to ask, who's the who's the main contact for that? I mean, who's driving well, that? Well, you probably probably talk to Ben Schulz first over in yep. School of Chemistry. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, Glenn, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.